Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day. We are back again with King Arthur Knight's Tale. I am so happy to finally be able to bring this review to you. Before we get into what I did and didn't like about the experience, let's quickly recap the story. King Arthur Knight's Tale is set in Arthurian mythology, but developer Neocore Games has made their own changes so that everything feels fresh. In the original mythos, King Arthur leads a legendary group of people called the Knights of the Round Table. Over time, he is drawn into a heated dispute with Sir Mordred, who depending on which version of the mythos you read, is either his nephew or his son. Most versions of this story end with Sir Mordred and King Arthur meeting on the field of battle and killing each other. Then King Arthur and his legendary sword Excalibur are taken to the island of Avalon, where one day he will be resurrected if the world needs to be protected once again. Knight's Tale answers the question of what would happen if something went wrong with the resurrection. Instead of being the valiant warrior everyone once knew, Arthur's presence is corrupting the land and causing violent creatures to spread havoc across Avalon. The Lady of the Lake, leader of Avalon, decides to resurrect Sir Mordred since he is the only one who has successfully defeated King Arthur. That's how the game starts with you taking control of Sir Mordred. Now let's get into what I like about the game. I think the premise is fantastic. You take control of someone who is widely known to be a villain but are not forced to play him that way. This unique premise carries the overall story, which is frankly just okay. There are no plot twists you don't see a mile away, and most of the story is just about getting you to the next mission. But throughout my 50 hour adventure, the amazing premise was a thread that kept pulling me along. Part of that strong pull is the amazing cast of characters you connect with throughout the game. It's really fascinating to meet all the major figures in Arthurian legend, most of whom despise Sir Mordred and convince them to join your team. This is also where Neocore Games truly shines because they have taken big characters who are not particularly famous and use them to create really enthralling stories. Avalon has changed a lot of characters, so they are not necessarily the same type of people they were in the original mythos. What's really incredible about this accomplishment is none of these characters get more than one quest. So unlike most games where party members have multiple personal quests where you get to know them, these characters get one time to make an impact, and then usually that's it. Despite this, there were multiple characters I grew attached to simply off the memories of that one journey together. The voice acting helps in this regard as well, and is solid throughout the game. Once you have recruited a hero and put them on your team, they will be available to handle events. Events are random problems that you select a hero to deal with. It is absolutely possible to fail an event, so you need to read the description carefully and decide which hero is best suited for the particular task. Some events clearly call for a Christian. Others call for someone who is ruthless. There are also some events that are particular to a specific hero. For example, Lady Dendrain would periodically ask for permission to hunt a dangerous beast, something that my other heroes never asked me to do. These events oftentimes require you to make a morality choice, and they are a great way to keep you connected with heroes you don't necessarily use on a regular basis. Even if you don't find a hero's quest to be particularly enthralling, you might still grow attached to them due to the class mechanics, which are absolutely incredible in this game. So there are six different classes, Defender, Champion, Vanguard, Marksman, Sage, and Arcanist. Each one has a core purpose that most of the abilities adhere to. Defenders are tanks, champions are damage dealers, sages use support spells, etc, etc. The truly amazing thing about this system is that no two characters are the same. So you can have two heroes that are sages, but their character sheet will look very different. They might have the same abilities, but those abilities unlock at different points in the game, significantly changing how you play them. Also, many characters have unique abilities that cannot be found on their peers. I spent hours diving into the mechanics for everyone I picked up, and it was so much fun. I really like the way gear works in this game as well. While you are exploring, hidden chests or quests will reward you with different items you can equip or use. There's also a merchant store where you can purchase gear and an enchanted tower where you can buy relics, which are high quality weapons and armor. 
All of this is randomized, so you are forced to really read the different equipment options and figure out what fits with your playstyle. If you are diligent about your character builds and meticulously pick gear that assists your style of play, the game rewards you. I think the system works great as long as you are paying attention. All of this blends together into combat, which is absolutely fantastic. While out on a mission, you are not allowed to equip new potions and healing is very limited. Therefore, each combat encounter is important because if you are too weakened when you reach the final boss, there's no choice but to start over again. So in combat, you are rewarded not only for winning, but also for doing it while taking a minimal amount of damage. It takes a while to really understand this and figure out the best mix of talents that will minimize damage against your team. Enemies utilize a variety of skills and buffs, forcing the player to use all the mechanics available. It's rare I notice something like this, but I really like the difficulty curve in the game. It starts out really smooth for the first three levels, and you probably start thinking the game is too easy. Then there's a sharp uptick in difficulty, and after a while you figure out how to conquer that. Then there's a sharp uptick again. Each increase in difficulty is paired with new enemies that oftentimes use different mechanics from the ones you previously dealt with. This significantly helps to keep combat difficult and fresh. You can change the difficulty to story, normal, hard, or very hard, depending on the type of challenge you want. There's also a roguelite mode for those of you who want to take things to the extreme. Finally, I really enjoy the morality system this game uses. The game has a two-axis system that forces you to make a choice between righteous or tyrannical and a choice between believing in Christianity or old faith. The religious options are not choices between good and evil, since either one can have you making very vicious decisions. As mentioned before, I appreciate that we have the flexibility to play Sor Mordred as someone who is righteous if we want to. I think the game provides interesting scenarios for you to make decisions, pushing your morality into a particular direction. I also think it's really cool that you are locked out of some heroes and Camelot upgrades based on your morality choices. I am definitely looking forward to a Tyrant Old Faith playthrough just to unlock Morgana Le Fay. The only issue I have is the game should provide more opportunities to make morality choices. I did all the content in the game, and literally one time, I didn't take a Christian option when it was available, so I was not able to max it. Also, there were long stretches where I was not presented with any morality choices, and it felt rather strange. There are some things in the game I am neutral about, starting with how Camelot has been implemented. This is your hub and the place where you build up different functionality to use in the game. On the one hand, there are a lot of different upgrades and it will literally take you the entire game to get them all. This means there's always something to spend money on, which I appreciate as opposed to having loads of cash sitting around doing nothing, which I experience a lot in games. However, I am not a fan of how the game forces you to have a backup team. Vitality does not automatically regenerate in this game, and if it is damaged, your character must go to the hospital. If enemies are able to significantly damage your vitality, then you must go to the cathedral, which will heal any injuries your heroes have. Each of these actions take time, and the game measures time in terms of missions. So to heal vitality and then injuries will take at least two missions where you are without a particular character. Now on the one hand, this system really rewards competent play. If you screw up and your party is heavily damaged, then you will have to set out one or possibly multiple missions and you will probably pay money to get them healed. That means you absolutely must use the training ground to level up four backup heroes who you can sub into the main group when necessary. This all makes sense in the game world, and honestly, I appreciate a game that punishes mistakes. But I am just not a fan of being without my main party members. I enjoy choosing which party members I like best and then rolling with that squad the entire game. You will most likely get deep into the game before you are good enough and your gear is good enough that the main squad can clear missions back to back to back with no vitality damage or injuries. It would be nice if Camelot provided more ways to speed this up and get your critical heroes back faster. Also, I am neutral on the post-game content that is provided. So the main quest line takes you to level 21, and then there's post-game content that goes up to level 28. The game caps you at level 25. 
The post-game content comes in the form of around a dozen side quests where you face a variety of enemies and three main quests where you face bosses more powerful than anything experienced in the main game. On the one hand, I really appreciate a developer who gives you everything up front. A lot of developers would have forced the player to shell out money for this content. Also, the character design of the major bosses is pretty awesome and distinctive from what you have seen up to that point. All that being said, the post-game content clearly lacks polish in comparison to the rest of the game. Bugs prevented me from finishing some fights, there is no voice acting, and frankly, the side quests feel pointless. Oftentimes, in the Arthur main quest, you have conversations with people that provide context for what you are being asked to do. Since there is no voice acting in the post game, even during a quest when you are escorting a character, little context is provided and it makes what you are doing feel like a bunch of busy work. I hate to say it, but honestly, I would have preferred Neocore Games hold on to this content, polish it properly, and then release it as a DLC. Quick note before we get to things I didn't like about the game. If you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate you hitting the like button. This information tells me which content the channel is enjoying and helps my video spread to more people. I really appreciate all of the support. All right, let's get into what I didn't like about the game, starting with hero management. I spoke about this issue in my 20 hour impressions video, but I might've done a poor job of communicating it because some of you seem confused. Hopefully I will do a better job this time. So looking at the round table screen, there are 12 slots at the bottom where you can place heroes. This is your main team, which means you can take them on missions, assign them to the training ground to gain XP, and you can select them to handle events. You can never have more than 12 heroes assigned to your main team. If you recruit a new hero and there's an open slot on the main team, then that new hero will automatically fill that slot. You also have an aspirant hero section. This is essentially your bench. Heroes in this section cannot be used to do anything. They are essentially dead weight. These heroes will never trigger unique events because they are not really considered to be part of your team. If you recruit a new hero and all the slots for your main team are filled, then that hero will automatically be placed on your bench. You can have an infinite amount of heroes sitting on your bench. If you want to take someone off your bench and move them to your full main team, then you must dismiss someone from your main team. Dismiss is the same thing as delete. You will never see that party member again. There is no way to take a person on your main team and place them on the bench. This system essentially forces you to delete party members you recruit, either because they are on your main team and you need room, or you know they are never going to leave your bench, so having them serves no point. To help explain why this is a problem, let me get into another issue I have with the game. In my opinion, Knight's Tale takes too long to give you the characters everybody familiar with the mythos really wants. Merlin, Sir Lancelot, Lady Guinevere, and Sir Galahad are all either mid-game or late-game recruits. Consequently, the game spends the first 10 levels filling your party up with bit characters that Neocore Games has made very endearing, then it introduces the lore-heavy characters and makes you delete ones you have grown attached to in order to make room. I think this is a terrible system that adds unnecessary complication to the game. There is no reasoning given for why you need a bench or why the amount of heroes you can have is limited. In fact, the game does a fantastic job of communicating that things are messed up everywhere and there's plenty of work to go around. For heroes to consistently get XP, they need to either be on missions or in the training ground. So even if you have a main team of 20 heroes, only eight of them are actually getting powerful. There are no balancing issues with letting you keep everyone you recruit. I am not going to harp long on my next issue with the game because I know it's going to cause a lot of eye rolls, but this is my review and dag nabbit, this issue is important to me. I believe the game will be better served by allowing for romance options. I was disappointed to find out I can only defeat Arthur in combat. I cannot take his queen as my bride. I feel like this would absolutely be something a power-hungry, tyrannical Sir Mordred would do, 
and the game should allow for this. On the flip side, my righteous Christian Sir Mordred had strong feelings for Lady Dendrain that I am not allowed to share. I am one of those guys who loves romance options in all my RPGs, so please forgive me. The last point on this list isn't really an issue I have with the game, it's just something I find baffling. The file size to download this game is 120 gigs. It doesn't impact me since I have a terabyte set aside just to download games, but I know some people have serious storage limitations. Beyond that, I cannot remember the last game I played which required that large a download. This game is heavily segmented and makes no attempt at being open world. I am not sure what's in it that causes the large size. Let's touch on stability for a minute, which is definitely a high point of the game. In my entire playthrough, the game only crashed once, and there was only one time I couldn't complete a secondary objective due to a bug. I originally had other issues with the game, but they have all been cleared up by the April 29th patch, which also added a quick save option to the game. Obviously, this is outside of the issues I mentioned with post-game content, but big kudos to Neocore Games for releasing a 50-hour experience that is bug-free. Bottom line, I had a great time with King Arthur Knight's Tale. Fantastic personal stories, deep lore, enthralling mechanics, and engaging combat all come together to create a phenomenal experience. I am looking forward to diving in for the second time. The game is currently available for PC on Steam. It does come with controller and wide monitor support. Minimum PC requirements are Windows 10, 64-bit for the OS, and obviously 120 gigs for storage. For CPU, you want an Intel i5-4690 or an AMD FX4350 along with 8 gigs of RAM. For the GPU, you want an NVIDIA GTX 780 or AMD Radeon R9-280X. While this has not been announced by Neocore Games, it does appear there will be a console release later down the line. Hope all of you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave me a like, share this content, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.